Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light. Peace and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of spirit, your living word that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Emma. Amen. To preface that prayer, that was actually sent to me by Corinne. I've used it on a couple episodes, so I thought it would be appropriate to use today. But you guys, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Imagination. I'm super excited today. I'm joined by Becky and Bridget of our sister podcast, Yay! Our Children's <laughs> Podcast. And we're doing part two with Corinne Klein, who was on last week's episode. I encourage you guys to go listen to that. We go a little bit more into her backstory. Um, we talk a lot about her. Uh, today, we're going to be expanding on that conversation. Um, Corinne's actually a survivor herself. She works in Tennessee at a rescue called Rescue One Global that actually works directly with children straight out of trafficking. And she is just an amazing voice for the voiceless. She's an incredible mother. She's a wife. She is a woman of God. She's also a fierce advocate against the CPS foster care system, um, speaking out against it from her personal experiences, adopting her own daughter. And she just has <laughs> so much insight to offer. And I'm so excited to have her here again today. Corinne, thank you for being here. Thanks, Emma. You always make me feel so good about myself. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just adore so you. I adore you. <laughs> for people who might just be tuning in for their first time, um, could you give just a little bit of background info on a little bit more expansion on what I said about your career, who you are, and just a little background info? Yeah. So like she said, I'm a mom um, and a wife and I have four kids. Um, three boys by birth and our daughter was adopted through foster care and um, we've also fostered a few kids we actually have a son um, in Ukraine we're trying to get here um, he's too old to be adopted but we fostered him for many years and we're trying to get him back here um, especially with the conflict in Russia so I'm following that really closely right now um, and so Back in probably 2017, 2018, went through major life crisis where I was in the hospital for a year and a half and God just really used that time to wake me up, um, just get me totally surrendered to him. And, um, and I just, when I came out of that, I was like, Lord, what do, what do I do with my life? Um, you know, you just, you face death and you come back from it and you're just kind of like, so shucking up and not knowing, um, why you're here, why you're still here when you should have died. And the Lord just really started to slowly direct me and my husband on what our next steps were. I just knew that whatever I did, I wanted it to have purpose. I didn't want to just do the American dream thing and just, um, live a comfortable life. I knew that I probably don't have that much time left here on earth because there's still a lot of health issues and I didn't want to waste it. Right. So I was just like, okay, God, I'm yours. Tell me what to do, you know? And that's kind of how I've lived my life ever since. Um, just every week, like, okay, what do I do now? Like, what would you have me do? Um, and during all that time, he really did open my eyes to trafficking. Um, I had already learned quite a bit about it from being a foster parent and being in the foster system in California. Um, it was quite a mess and through a relationship with our daughter's birth mom, just learned her story growing up in the foster system and just how um, corrupted all that is. And, um, it just really started to open my eyes to the root issue underneath it all, which is trafficking. 
and using, you know, these children as um, a commodity. Um, and so I just like, I became incredibly passionate about it. I just learned everything I could. And then the Lord was like, you need to move to Tennessee to um, save your kids. And so we moved to Tennessee um, thinking it was all about our kids and we were just trying to give them a better life um, here in the country in Tennessee. And um, we got all settled in and my husband got a job and we got a house. And then the Lord started saying things like, I'm going to bring people that need rescuing to you. And I'm like, what, <laughs> like, what's that about? And at first I thought, well, maybe like people are going to be fleeing California and God's going to bring me people that need to be rescued from California. And, um, the more I prayed about it, it became very clear that the Lord was telling me to pursue getting more involved fighting trafficking and that the people he was going to bring me that need rescuing were people out of, um, trafficking. And so specifically women and girls. And so I really started to pursue um, whatever avenue in middle Tennessee was available to fight trafficking and started with a bigger organization. And then eventually um, the Lord just kind of dropped into my lap through one of the main staff members, the opportunity to serve at Rescue One Global. And I remember this lady I work with, she sat me down to coffee and she told me what she did. And she told me how she would be with the girls when they were first rescued. And um, she had just spent like a whole week with a girl that had just been rescued and um, told me about how she um, just loved on her and allowed her to feel safe and get out of that fight or flight mode before they decided where she would go next. And then she told me about what she does at the safe house under rescue one. And, um, and I was just sitting there and like, when the conversation was over, I was like, this is exactly what I am looking for. This is exactly what God has told me I need to do. Um, get me in, like, what can I do? And so immediately signed up with paperwork and all, you know, you have to go through all their steps to, um, be, you know, background checked and stuff, but, um, got involved in that. And so it's been about six months now we've lived in Tennessee now about probably 15 months. And I've been involved with rescue one now a good six months and finally really learning how they work. Um, and also we are working on opening up our own little safe house on our property out in the country. Um, because currently Rescue One just has safe houses in the city in Nashville, and they would love to have more out in the country, especially for girls that have been trafficked in Nashville. Um, you know, to keep them safe, sometimes we have to send them out of state to another safe house. And so if we had more smaller ones opened up out in the country where some of us staff members live, then um, that would be an option to send them to. Um, or even like um, when they're ready to transition out of the safe house and they're more ready to live on their own. But there's like a step in between that where they're not totally ready to live on their own. They still need a staff member or a family kind of helping them get more independent. And so our safe house on our property would be available for that. So we are about halfway through building it, renovating it. And hopefully it'll be done by May is what our goal is. Um, we actually have a girl who's like asking me every week, when is it going to be done? Because she's going to be the first one to live in it. And she's so excited. And she just keeps asking me, when is it going to be done? And I'm like, well, let's just pray it gets done sooner, but let's shoot for May. <laughs> so um, that's kind of where we're at right now. But that is so amazing. It's so interesting learning this from you because it's, you know, we've really, our experiences have been limited um, as far as this material. A lot of the people that we've met have been dealing with nonprofits. And so hearing the difference between, you know, a corporation run 
with uh, trafficking survivors and safe houses, it's such a different dynamic. And it's so interesting, you know, the things that you guys are able to do that other companies aren't. And even more yeah. interesting is all the different, uh, for people listening, I've had Jack Pendergrass on, who I introduced to Corinne and- uh, Yeah, you know, he's great. There's also uh, another case that I've come across, Freedom for Gracie, that is in Tennessee. That's a really high profile case that I've been studying. Yeah. And be doing a podcast on that too, but it's interesting how Tennessee has been coming to the forefront with a lot of this stuff and people coming out of that state, speaking up and being vocal and it's awesome. What are you yeah. personally seeing living in Tennessee, understanding the dynamic of that state? You've been in California also. What is kind of the dynamic that you're seeing with trafficking? Is this something that is as common as a lot of people hypothesize it is? Is it, um, do you have statistics that, that you know of and kind of what are you seeing and where are you seeing this taking place mostly? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm more familiar with California just cause that's where I grew up and, um, we've always lived. And so in California, when I was learning about trafficking, it was like, um, you know, there's a highway 99 that runs straight up from Mexico, straight up through to uh, Canada. And that was known as like the main thoroughfare where children are brought into the country or um, just trafficked through. And so I felt like in California, it was super obvious. Like you knew, you kind of knew like places to avoid, you knew it was going on. Um, and when your enemy is really obvious, it's easier to protect your kids and, and to stand up to it. When we got here, I remember thinking, Tennessee is like perfect. Like that's what I thought when we came here. I'm like, it's beautiful. They don't have all the regulations that California has. So it's more pro freedom. It's, um, tons of families it's a great place to raise your kids there's churches on every corner like it's just ideal right like ideal and you just think oh my gosh this place is amazing and I thought it was funny that God had moved us here when I wanted to fight trafficking because I was like why would he move us to the perfect place that does not have trafficking and I I was blown away. I had no idea. The more I got involved here and the more I looked into it, the more I was like, it is just as bad here as California, just as bad. But there's so much money in this area that it's really easy to hide it. And it's really, e there's a lot of people involved that you would never in a million years suspect. So the enemy's more covert here it's hidden and that's actually in my opinion a lot harder to deal with because yeah. it's not so it's obvious true. who the perpetrators are and it's not so obvious the places you need to avoid because everything looks nice mm -hmm. and everyone looks like a good person here and so it's really but then you find out it's not that way so you're like then you're like you know questioning everything <laughs> like because you're finding out it's going down in every neighborhood, every community, especially the nicest communities, the wealthiest communities. That's where like most our perpetrators are coming from. Um, well, we, we are just always told the majority of the perpetrators are coming from a um, wealthy neighborhood in Franklin and Brentwood, which is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the whole United States. This is 40 to 50 year old men who are family men, they're leaders in the community, they're um, politicians, they're judges, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're pastors. Um, they have a lot of money and you would never in a million years think that that's going on behind closed doors with them. I mean, probably their families don't even know. So it's, it was just extremely disturbing to identify what's going on here and just how, um, hidden it is, you know? And, um, so it's, it's the same as California, as far as going on, 
it just looks different in Tennessee than it does in California. Yeah, it flips your whole reality too, because it's like so many yes. people don't suspect it. It's like it's happening in plain sight, especially in those type of communities where you're programmed to trust these people. And so many don't question it. And so then when you do bring that reality and flip it, it's like, whoa, how is this happening? And so many people can't fathom it and turn a blind eye to it because it's like, no, that person wouldn't do that. They're for the community. And it's like, yeah. no, they certainly are like that. And that that's the hardest part about trafficking in general is there's no type. Because like you said, they could be doctors or teachers or pastors or whatever. They could be male or female. They could be rich or poor. Like there is no one type of person that we can look and say, yep, you're a trafficker. Or at least you could be yeah. potentially be one. And that's what makes it so hard is it can be happening in every neighborhood in every part of this country. And we wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And even to learn, you know, it could be a principal at a school or a teacher. I mean, my kids go to a great little school that I want to be able to trust everyone, but as in the back of my mind, knowing the reality that I know, I'm always asking them, you know, if they, ha if they come home sad or they have a bad day, I'm just like, did anything happen? You know that when you go to the bathroom, you need to have the door locked. No one should ever touch you inappropriately. And I tell my kids all the time, like my kids probably know too much, but I tell them all the time, the perpetrator is going to be a teacher, a principal. It's going to be your youth pastor because I was molested as a child by a pastor. So I already know that it's going to be most likely someone that earned your trust, that your parents trust, and someone you would just never expect, you know? And so my kids know that, like they know there is no adult ever that tells you to keep a secret from mom and dad at all. I don't care how much you respect them. I don't care how much you look up to them. If they tell you to keep a secret, you run straight to us and you let us know what that secret was. Yep. So, um, you know, we can only do so much to protect our kids, but I'm at least trying, right? I'm doing all I can and obviously praying over them, praying protection over them every day when I drop them off at school. Um, you know, it's just, it's not easy to raise kids these days. <laughs> No, we have a whole podcast on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, and, and so many parents, like even you, you said it this way, but I don't think that it is. I don't think we can over-educate our kids. Now we can certainly non-age appropriately tell them things, but I don't think that we can over-educate them. And what I, I say repeatedly is darkness doesn't happen where light exists. So if we can tell mm. our kids, and even if our kids are there to help their friends or are there to be like, you know, he shouldn't have done that to you, or this seems a little weird or whatever that just spreads the light to everybody else. And so I don't think we can ever be, I don't think our kids can ever be over aware of things that could be had. We don't want to scare them, of course, but yeah, that's reality. Like somebody could, someone even in your own family that you love and admire and trust could do something to you that you don't know is inappropriate. I actually had a thought the other day that how simple it could be for something to happen. Like if you are, and I'm just going to say an uncle, I'm just going to use this for example, you are uncle and you have a five-year-old niece. And if that's your thing, all you have to do is give your niece a hug and let her sit on your lap and whatever a little bit. She doesn't know any different until she grows up and is like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, what? But that's yeah. how simple it is. And that's what so many people are like, oh, they would never do that. They might. And if your kids are uncomfortable, you've got to stop and say, why are you uncomfortable? If there's a situation where they're crying or they're upset, don't, don't listen to the adults anymore. Your kid has got to be number one priority. Why are you upset? Come talk to me. 
come figure it out because they may tell you something where you now have to face that other adult and be like, what were you doing? Yeah. And they're exactly. so young at that age, you know, it's like they, it's like you said, Becky, they don't know. And will they even remember as an adult, you know, so many of us don't have every single memory recall whenever we're five years old or three years old, you know, I what I did yesterday, a hundred percent. Corinne, having been around so many children that have just freshly come out, what is your advice to parents? If their child goes through some type of trauma, that's essentially what you do is comfort them directly after that. What it, what is kind of your process on comforting a child who just went through something really hard and is maybe disclosing, maybe hasn't disclosed yet verbally, but they've certainly disclosed enough to where you know that they're coming to you because they were trafficked. What is your advice or how do you handle that whenever that's right in front of you? Because that can be really hard too. Like Becky said, a lot of times parents are like, I'm going to go talk to the adult about it. Or, you know, are you sure you're telling me the truth? Are you sure you're not exaggerating? And that can be really hard for children to, you know, be okay at disclosing anymore after that if they already feel targeted. Yeah. It's raining. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> I oh, I see it on loud. your window. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think the, the easiest way to shut down a child is to say, I don't believe you and any victim in general, I don't believe you. Um, for me personally, that's a trigger. Like my husband knows if he says, I don't believe you, I'm probably going to flip out <laughs> because I think as a kid, even though I didn't recall what had happened to me as a kid until I was an adult, um, as a kid, subconsciously, I'm thinking, no one would ever believe me. This is a pastor. So you just stuff it, right? No one would ever believe you, even though I never did try to tell anybody. Um, so I don't believe you is a huge trigger because when it is someone that your family trusts, when it is someone that your family respects and looks up to, especially a pastor or a principal or, you know, the neighbor next door that is best friends with your dad, um, a kid automatically will think in their head, like, no one would ever believe me that this happened. And so um, that will just shut it off, right? Um, so how do you create a relationship with your child where they know whatever you say, whatever they say to you as mom, like you're going to believe them. You're going to be a safe place. And I have to work on this too, because there's the boy that cried wolf, of course, like where your kid's like, I'm too sick to go to school like every day. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I don't believe you. <laughs> but um, at the same time, like, I have to be really careful in that because I don't want it to be a scenario where they feel like mom never believes me. So, of course, she wouldn't believe me if I tell her that my teacher hurt me in the bathroom, you know. Um, so, I, what I'm focusing on personally and what I would recommend parents to focus on, like, what you can do with your child is let them know that you're a safe person and you will always choose to believe them. Now we can work through that and try to get to the bottom of what, what a situation is, but you want them to know that like, if they tell you something, you are on their side and you are going to believe them no matter who it is they're telling about. And, um, and just using discernment in that, but, um, that's kind of the, you know, how like pedophiles will groom a child, they'll groom a child to become, um, their prey. It's almost like we're reversing the grooming. We're grooming a child to trust us. We're grooming a child to know that mom and dad are safe and we're going to believe you and creating that before the abuse happens, because, you want that, you want that kind of an environment in your relationship with your child before the abuse ever happens, 
because once it happens, um, if that's not, if that kind of safety net isn't already created, they're probably not going to tell anybody. They're probably just going to stuff it, you know, because they'll think, well, mom and dad never believe me on anything. There's no way they're going to believe me on this. Um, so that's something I've personally really learned from my own experience and just from listening to so many different survivor stories that maybe did try to tell someone as a child or even tried to tell people as an adult and even as an adult, they're not believed. Um, the most empowering thing you can say to someone is I believe you. It's just, it's like balm to a wound. Like it just, it has so much power when you say that to somebody because they've, even when they're opening up to you, they're already in the back of their mind thinking they're probably not going to believe me, you know? And you, even if you're the only person that that victim tells, you have the power for them to go the route of healing and say, I believe you now let's start the healing or I don't believe you that person is going to be shut down and they may never tell another soul and they will carry that to their grave and it will affect every aspect of their life, every relationship. Um, so I think that parents need to understand how important their role is in believing their child. It's the difference between my child going, because of course stuff's gonna happen. It's out of our control, it's the world we live in. It's an evil world, it's full of hard things. But as a parent, you can help your child heal through those hard things, or you can shut them down where they're just gonna be screwed up for life because they're, gonna, they're always gonna carry that and they're never gonna talk about it. And that's the worst thing that can happen because it will manifest, you know, in bad behavior, not able to keep a relationship, not able to keep a job. Like it affects everything. So going off of that too, I think something that we often talk about on our podcasts as well is just listening and not overreacting. Mm -hmm. Because the minute yeah. that you overreact, yes, in certain circumstances, discipline is necessary. But at the same time, remembering too that you have created that safe spot for them to land and you don't want to initially overreact because the minute that you do that, your reaction is going to control their next reaction. So if you freak out or they automatically don't think that they're going to be believed or that you're going to question and interrogate them, they're automatically going to shut down. And now they no longer have that soft place to land. And now you just possibly ruined an opportunity of it could be something serious that they're trying to tell you. And as well as being present. So, so many people in today's day and age, we live, sorry, my dog came in. We live <laughs> in um, technology. And so many people are glued to their cell phones. So knowing to be present and when your child or even a family or friend come to talk to you, to put that down and be present, that way they know that you're actually listening and they have your full attention and they know that they can trust you. And that way, when something does occur, they know you're going to be there for them. So bouncing off of that, I think that's great advice as well as once we, Becky and I often talk about, and Emma is once we heal ourselves and go inner, then you're going to heal your child, the next generation, and you're not projecting on to others. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, um, you know, I, I didn't start my own journey of healing until my mid thirties. And I think all the time what a better mother and wife I would have been if I had started my healing journey earlier, because then I would have understood all these things that much sooner. And, um, thankfully by the grace of God, you know, we got through the first decade of my marriage and raising kids. Don't know how I got through it, but I did. <laughs> 
And then when I started to heal and I started to open up to other people and I started to deal with my own crap from my own childhood, that's when I feel like I really tapped into um, how I need to parent my kids. Um, so it's so true. It comes out of your own healing journey. And, um, you know, past generations, I think it's like, hear no evil, see no evil, you know, just sweep it under the rug. Don't, yeah, uncle so-and-so is kind of weird with kids, but like, that's just the way he is. Sweep it under the rug. And thankfully we live in a generation that's not okay with that anymore. And is like, no, the truth needs to come out period, no matter how painful it is. And typically the truth is extremely painful. This is not easy. Like it's not fun. It's not fun to realize that kids are being trafficked at churches. That is not fun because that wakes you up to a whole new reality that should not be. And yet it is. Mm -hmm. And it's not fun to realize that there's people in your family you can't trust, or there's whatever the situation is, um, it's painful, right? Like it's painful. But on the other side of that is living in reality and having healing so that your kids can be safe. Because when you're ignoring all of that and you're living in ignorance and you're pretending ignorance is bliss, everything's fine. That's how people get hurt. That's how kids get hurt. We can't, we can't afford to live like that because kids are going to get hurt if your eyes are closed and you're like, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. You're putting your kid at risk. You need to know these things. It's important, you know? Yeah. And I don't want parents to think that, oh, it's too late. My kid's already 10 or my kid's already yeah. this age. Because even for me, like I started this whole journey on a health journey and my now 11 year old doesn't even remember a time when I ate McDonald's and I'd eat it four or five times a week. And so it doesn't take much for you to heal yourself, to heal your family and to the point where they don't even remember the way that it was before. And so it's never too late. I'm with you. I wish I would have been a better, better mom the first decade, but I'm making up for it now because now it really is okay. What I needed when I was 13 or 11, now I'm giving to you because now I know better. And so I don't want people to say like, well, my kids are already too late. Why fix it? Yeah, it's hard but it's time to fix it. And there's no too late to do it. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, we're all on a different journey of healing. I mean, we, I know Emma's like interviewing someone who she didn't realize what had happened to her as a kid until like her sixties. Right. Emma, like, yeah, she was like, you know, yeah. I mean, God has all of us on a different journey. No one's journey of healing is going to look the same as someone else's. And he knows when we're ready to deal with our crap, like 10, the first 10 years of raising kids in survival mode and um, being a foster parent, all the things we went to, like if God had thrown on top of that, like, okay, now we're going to bring up your whole childhood too. I probably would have been like a ball, like rocking in the corner. Like somebody just medicate me. <laughs> like I can't even function, you know, and we have to be able to function. And like, as kids, that's why we do put those trauma memories in the back of our mind and we just keep going because it's almost like the grace of God going like, okay, we'll deal with that when you're ready. Let's just keep functioning because you still have to go to school. You still have to do all these things. And, and, and then God is so gentle and how he's, he finally knows when you're ready to bring it forward and go, okay, now we're going to deal with the junk you went through as a kid and we're going to heal and yeah, it might get worse before it gets better. I mean, when I started bringing up stuff from my past, I remember feeling like I was way worse off than I was before I brought it up. And I thought, why am I doing this? This is insane. But it was, it was that goal of knowing, like, if I can get through the memories and get through the being re-traumatized by it all, then on the other side of that is healing. And I'll finally be able to understand myself better and be able to just be a better person for those around me so that I'm not constantly triggered and constantly, you know, upset about this or that and not even knowing why I'm upset about this or that, you know, you just, 
you, it's such a good thing to heal, but it, there's no, there's no like formula for it, you know, and, and you don't know when God's going to have you ready to deal with all that. So. Well, it's, yeah. it's interesting too, that all of you guys are talking about this and going back to the beginning period where Becky was talking about grooming and stuff. Healing is a perpetrator's worst nightmare. There's reasons why we're not taught this stuff. And when you look at what Corinne said, where a lot of these people reside in rich communities and positions of power in our schools, around kids, coaches, pediatricians, whatever it is, those people don't want us to know that information because that means that we have a defense against them and our education and our knowledge is our antithesis to their mind control over us. So it's actually combating in a really interesting way. It's not something you even have to leave your house to do a lot of the times, you know, to combat human trafficking, to combat abuse. A lot of times that's just learning what abuse is and where it hides and how it hides and understanding that your nativity to it and your ignorance to it is exactly what they want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I had just moved here to Tennessee and not learned anything about what's going on the underbelly of Tennessee, right? I probably would still just be driving around assuming everything is as it seems. It seems idyllic. It seems there's a lot of Christians. It seems there's a lot of solid families. And I'd just be driving around like, wow, I've died and gone to heaven. This is amazing. But the reality is that doesn't exist anywhere. You know, there's nowhere to hide from evil in this world. So um, you know, I can't say that because I know all that I know now that my kids will be safe because that's also out of my control. I can only do so much. Um, but my hope and my prayer is that because I've done all I can to prepare them for what this looks like in this area, that if it does happen, they're going to tell me and, and Hopefully they're never going to be put in that situation because they'll know better than to be alone with another adult that is trustworthy. <laughs> so, I mean, I tell them too, I'm like, you can kick them where the sun sh don't shine. You can scream, you can gouge their eyes out. I don't care what you have to do. If you don't feel safe, you will not get in trouble for hurting an adult. Do whatever you have to do to get away from them. So, well, too, and I think remembering that we live in a generation where times are different than when we all grew up. And especially with technology, we were outside playing as kids and we weren't sucked into the technology and our phones and everything that society pressures the kids with nowadays. But then you sit back and you're like, where's the parents? Like, Parents have to learn to be accountable as well and not just trust those doctors, the teachers, um, whatever, the church pastors, and you really have to question, is there even sports is so many parents see those places, even school as a free daycare. It's like, do they have a background check? What do you know if something was to happen to your kid? Do you know where your child is? And even like going to sleepovers and like knowing where your kid is and those families, like you really have to take a step back and knowing that how we all grew up was different than now. And then whatever mm -hmm. is normal in all of our houses may be normal and some not normal in somebody else's houses. So then it goes back to grooming where some people grew up where domestic violence is okay and normal in that household. I'm not saying that it's okay, but in that household, that's normal. And they're allowing that child to see that. So now when that child grows up and they get into relationships now to them, that's not toxicity until they finally heal themselves and realize, whoa, that wasn't okay. And seeing those patterns and really addressing them and being accountable, parents have to do that because so many people forget that the kids are watching everything that we're doing and saying 
they might not come out and say it, but the behaviors is a model behavior of what is being passed down to them, whether it's from the parents, whether it's from technology, whether it's from friends, it all comes from the environment that they're around and that we're placing them in. So we really have to be mindful and use discernment of even the music and what we're allowing them to see. Uh, The TV shows on Disney and all of the programming going on because most parents don't even take the time to sit down and watch what their kids are watching on Disney or even the movies. So there's so much symbolism and programming in all of that. And we really have to educate ourselves as parents because the more we educate ourselves, we can not only become better parents, but then our children are going to be better in the future by just learning and bettering ourselves as a parent and not trusting okay, just because the doctor says you have to take this pill or this is what's wrong with you. Really go in her and say, why is my health like this? What are we eating? What are are we exercising? So different things like that is just not always trusting what is always been normal in society's world and going Mm -hmm. against that and, and learning when it, especially I know all of us are big on uh, herbal and natural healing And so even just looking at those options as well, and if it's hard because you might feel like you're alone, but again, you're only helping yourself and create a better generation with your child in the future. And gosh, that's so important to what you were saying about (laughs) being aware of people around you. You know, it's like, I even look at, I, I talk about, I talked about this a little bit ago, but the one case in Tennessee that I was recently introduced to the freedom for Gracie justice for grant case, like that involves like the entire state of Tennessee from the top down in a church school, in a family, political figures, bank figures. Right. And it's like, yeah. that is very eye opening to look at the key suspects. It's not this crackhead off the street. That's, you know, being alleged to have been complicit in the murder of a child it's a father who works as a financial advisor at a bank who attended church, you know, who's an outstanding citizen in society, you know, and these are things that it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that a judge, that a lawyer, that a father that's, you know, esteemed in society, that a pastor, but all of those things too are so important. And hearing Corinne talk about what she's seeing just from her own perspective, that these children are coming out of rich communities and from affluent people. This isn't somebody off the street who was dragged in from Mexico. We know that that's happening, especially in Arizona. Right. But yeah, this is affluent people involved with these things, you know, and and Corinne, could you talk a little bit more about what rescue one global is doing, what kind of their goals are and kind of their process for getting these children, you know, how does that happen that a call from a rich community is uh, contacts you and and you guys are made aware of these things. Yeah. I think the sad thing is honestly, is that the wealthier, the family of the child, the greater the cover up, right? So like a lot of our girls that we're rescuing, um, were out of foster care. So they didn't have anyone to advocate for them. Um, or, Um, you know, we have, we have a girl and a child from Guatemala. Um, So, you know, those are the ones that we're finding ending up in our safe house. Um, The, and yet it is going on at every level. So the more in the more affluent communities where it's happening, um, what I'm noticing is there's a lot of not believing the child um if it does go to court you know the the judge and the lawyer are being um bought off on the side to just let it go let's not you know let's not make a big deal of this there's media blackout to make sure the public doesn't find out that it's their pastor or it's their you know news anchor um so I, I think what I'm realizing is that um, the more money, the more the cover up, 
because you can afford to cover it up. And so that's what's truly breaking my heart is that I've seen these kids, these teens rescued off the streets that are, you know, in a dire situation, they don't have anyone to help them. So they're ending up in our safe house and they're safe and their cases are being turned in to the proper um, task force that try, we have a task force that goes after their traffickers. And that's amazing. That whole system is amazing. But when it's a kid that comes from affluent, an affluent family, they're beating against a brick wall trying to get justice. They're not, their child is not safe. Um, DCS is stepping in and removing the child and putting the child with the perpetrator because underneath all that, there's connections, these powerful connections and money where they can just um, allow it to continue and there's no justice being done. And those are the cases that drive me nuts. I feel like um, Rescue One is really able to help on low level trafficking and I think this is just in general. A lot of these organizations and ministries, they're doing a great job at the low level trafficking, but the high level trafficking were. Oh no, did her phone die? You're muted, Emma. Okay. This is so interesting. Kern should hopefully come back on. I'm sure she just lost reception. She's not wrong. That that is exactly oh, getting good. Wrong. They're like yeah. too, saying too much. Click. I know. <laughs> hey, Becky, you we welcome. gotta pull out our little. <laughs> I gotta oh, hold on. I gotta get it. We got, uh, uh, Emma, we have yeah. you one. It'd be on the way. But whenever we, oh, whenever technology acts crazy, we hold these, and on the back it says, "I am grateful." So whenever you see these in our hands during our podcast and tech is being weird, um, we pray. So you'll see us like hold them and do a prayer like while the other person's talking. Oh my yeah. gosh, because I love that. Because that stuff happens regularly to us where you're like, okay, someone's listening. What are you talking about? Like, don't think, I mean, her phone could have died, but if her yeah. phone didn't die and just something weird happened, don't think it wasn't on purpose. Like she was talking big stuff. Like that's how this stuff works. That's always how it works. You know, or Especially people- when you talk about God or your talking about this level of trafficking it always happens to us all the time yep and I know it happens to Emma all the time a hundred percent you know they don't want us talking about that <laughs> especially when all of us are on stage at once I know. And they're like yeah Satan's going oh shit I know <laughs> but don't you think that's why this is so hard for people to comprehend because a lot of the people that are being accused of this it's rare that it's that crackhead looking person off the street. That's not so, the majority of who these perpetrators are. People they you take know. All the blame. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So interesting. I had a, a lunch meeting, not his, not a meeting. I lunch with my mother the other day, felt like a meeting. Um, and she was talking, we were talking about Walt Disney, because of course we're going on this Disney trip that it's family trip, and I don't really know where I feel about it. But Uh, she's like, uh, your sister showed me that you posted something about Walt Disney being a pedophile. And I said, yes, mom, he was, he was a Freemason and blah, 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 whatever. She goes, but if I looked up on Google and I saw something that said he gave a whole bunch of money to people and he was a good guy, I said, she goes, what, what makes what, you know, different? I said, first of all, I wouldn't use Google. Number one, number two, I said, I don't care. I said, first of all, it's all who those people are. So yes, someone is only going to see him as the good person. If there is, if he goes to church, if he gives money, if he does whatever, if they don't have any interaction negatively, how would they know otherwise? I said, but if you have a story where he has abused a child, does that not negate every good thing he's ever done? Because I don't care if he's done good things. The minute you do this, now it's a it's a non-starter. And she's like, well, how do you even know this stuff? I'm like, we actually talk to the people who have been abused by these people, like firsthand. That's how we know. So we're not making this stuff up. And so she didn't really know where to go with that. But I was like, 
it negates all good if you someone finds out that they raped someone or they hurt someone like what the hell and so many people forget that that's a tax write-off like look at the foundation that they're building their group disney's groom look at all the celebrities that have gone crazy mk ultra and it leads them as they get older into satanic ritual abuse and you've seen the route it's taken so many and there's there's no way out usually once they start talking they either mysteriously die or commit suicide or literally just stuck in it and Mm -hmm. slaves yeah so that's the other thing is it's just a tax write-off or the money that they are putting into donations or whatever they're putting them into their own foundations so it's really just a clean way of money laundering the rich have the rich have gotten away with that forever absolutely or you give it to church as a cover or they're just like, buying they also from know how to make them look good and adopting them and trafficking them in another country she's back yay she's back justin oh she's good there, there she go. is. We were just saying Satan didn't like what you were talking about. <laughs> I think are you- so oh, there she is. it's okay. I had my phone charged and everything and it still died on me. <laughs> told you, told you. I said, it, the only thing that would mean it wasn't something as if her battery died. I said, otherwise big tech or Satan are involved. One and the same, let's be honest, <laughs> are involved and they're going to kick was- us off. You were just getting to the good part cool too. Story. Yeah, I wish it was some cool story that like someone's listening in on us and cut it off, but it's not. It's just my phone. <laughs> Nothing important <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah, but the three of us or the four of us together, that's a lot of power. Yes. That's a lot of power. That's true. And I did charge my phone, so Yay! Satan made it turn off. <laughs> Well, if you want to pick up um, where you yeah. left off, that was, you were just, we were like on a cliffhanger and we were all like, darn, it was just. I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but gosh. So yeah, what I was saying is that there is definitely, um, there is definitely a lot of success in fighting low level trafficking, these organizations and the ministries that are doing it well. Um, the majority of who we're seeing come in is going to be um, an immigrant from another country or um, someone from the foster system, like 80% of them are kids growing up in the foster system. So that's what we're seeing. And I call that low level trafficking because um, there's no super important family involved. Um, Now the perpetrators might be someone really important in the community, but they're being trafficked by like a a guy that's just on drugs on the street. And so that's the guy we'll come after. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, we we got justice, we solved this. Well, not really, because we've put away a low guy, but there's gonna be like 10 more to fill his place. And underneath all that at the root are these super wealthy individuals that can afford to keep their hands clean, you know, and can afford to never be, in a courtroom paying for their crime ever. So that's kind of what I've noticed. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing the low level trafficking. I mean, we're still, we're rescuing a human being that is huge. I don't care if you come from the wealthiest family or you don't even have a mom and dad. In God's eyes, we're all the same. We're all children of God. And have value and are made in God's image and never would deserve to be sold. No human being should ever be sold. Um, But I think where I get really frustrated is that I know that the root of all of this is really high level people with lots of money and lots of power. And we're never getting them because they have all the money and the power to cover it up. And so that just really, that does frustrate me because I know like, yeah, we're getting justice, but if you don't get to the root, it's just going to keep happening, you know? A hundred percent. I know. And it, it is frustrating because it's almost like these, how you say lower level cases become the scapegoats 
If you're taking care of the low level, then people think it's being taken care of. And in their mind, they're not assuming there's anything more, you know, it's covered up that good. People can't even fathom that people in these high level positions could do something like this. Now, if people want to learn more about Rescue One, um, if they want to contact you, how can they do that? Um, you can go to rescueoneglobal.org, and it's with the number one. So rescueoneglobal.org is our website. And there's ways you can give online. You can volunteer. You can um, become an advocate. Just all kinds of different things you can do, even just to educate yourself on it. Um, and then for me, I'm Corinne, uh, my email is Corinne at rescueoneglobal.org. Yeah, I think it's dot org. <laughs> so I don't use my work email that much, but I check it at least once a week. And so that's probably the best way. I'm also on Telegram, but I don't, I'm not super involved other than just for my own personal research. Um, Lurking. <laughs> but I love, I love Telegram because I, I love unfiltered truth and I, I love hearing people's stories and you definitely get that on Telegram. So I like it a lot. Well, I love it too. That's where we met you. So I'm so grateful for yeah. Telegram. It's introduced us to some really cool so people. So grateful. Yeah. I was going to say, so if, you come, yeah. if you come to the Standby Survivors Telegram page, Corinne's in there. So yep. you can find that. Yes. Yes. Yes, my sweet girls have let me contribute a little bit too to that. So that's you're literally I, you're like an honorary member of our team. We love you. Yeah, you so are grateful that yeah. you keep into our life. We literally talk to you every day, so it's it's been fun. I love it. Oh, I know so you girls are the best. I love you so much, and I feel like what what I love about what you guys are doing, I feel like you are shining a big spotlight on the more the higher level cases, like the underbelly, right, the root. And because at my, my job, at what I do um, with these girls, because it's low level, I love that I'm also involved with you guys in some of these more high profile um, cases. It goes hand in hand because if we can shine a light on these higher profile cases, then hopefully we're going to start getting these perpetrators who are so high up, who have like a hundred guys under them who are then trafficking the girls that I'm seeing. So, you know, I, I feel like what you guys are doing is so important because the, the organizations that are doing the good work, they can only do so much, you know, we're not able to get to the root like you guys are doing. Um, and just teaching the public what this looks like, like you said, like um, how to protect your kids and how to, educate them all of that just reaps so much reward knowing that there's probably you have no idea how many children you've saved just by what you you girls have done like you guys have literally saved children from being trafficked and so don't ever let big tech or these powerful rich bullies silence you because you're literally saving people's lives. That's how I look at it. Thank you. And everything that you're doing, honestly, you inspire us to even go and continue to do what we're doing. We work hand in hand and it takes all of us. And what we've learned from a local level is even with organizations who are nonprofits that work closely with uh, CPS. And what we've learned is we've had an opportunity in, in talks of going in and teaching them because mm. what happens is they're so focused on the lower level and dealing with the lower level that now they're dealing with survivors who have been trafficked at a higher level. And now they're coming to some of the safe houses in Arizona and they are not believing the survivors. And we've talked to some of yeah. the survivors there who have been through there and they're like, they didn't believe me. We're getting sentimental institutes or they're getting, mm-hmm. there's different things that go on in all of them. And so when it comes to the higher level, trafficking looks different 
from the low level all the way up. And then once you get to the elite level, it looks completely different. And then you get to satanic ritual abuse and that's a whole nother level. So many people aren't ready to face and you can't fathom it. Like there's stories that we hear and there's some, we can't fathom it, but we've learned so much from the survivors. So now having that experience of working with the survivors and listening to them, now we are able to go into a local level and we're being asked to help teach them what is satanic ritual abuse, which is only going to benefit the survivors. And so many people in, in the safe houses, for those who are working in them, I would suggest, and I know you do a great job of this, Corinne, is anyone who's listening who is working hands-on with the survivors, honestly, if more people were to listen to the survivors, they will tell you, if you ask them their input, and when it comes to healing, they will tell you what will work and what will heal, help heal them because satanic ritual abuse, there's no, nothing that is out there, whether it's going to a doctor or whatever medication they want to give you, there is nothing that can heal that. But the survivors know firsthand what has personally helped them heal and change and become who they are today based on their experience. So if you really want as a community safe house, everyone working with the survivors, if you really want that perfect dream center safe house, listen to the survivors. They'll help you create that, whether it's putting therapy when it comes to letting them build their own gardens and different hands-on things that we constantly hear the survivors say, I wish the safe houses would do this, or I wish we had a place that would do this. So working hands-on with them has been quite the experience because now we can go into our local level and say, they're not crazy. This is happening. And this is how we can help educate you and and learn from one another. Yeah, that's huge because, you know, we finally got our first like SRA, um, survivor come to us for help and you know I was with girls have been who have been doing this a lot longer than I have and they had no idea what SRA was or what to do and thankfully because of you guys and because of the survivors that you interview who are educating all of us I was able to provide them with a wealth of info and be like okay (laughs) you girls like everybody on staff like you guys need to learn about this because we're going to start seeing this a lot more (laughs) as as god just starts to bring all this out and like you said it's a whole nother beast um what might work for someone rescued off the streets it's not going to work for someone who is survived has survived sra in their own family it's just a whole nother beast and so um i've personally been trying to learn everything I can through you guys especially through the women and the men that you interview because it's just such priceless info and the Lord keeps putting on my heart that that is the next battleground like that's where he'll be moving me into next um I don't know what that's gonna look like but right now just like how I had to learn everything about trafficking now I'm trying to learn everything I can about SRA because the Lord just keeps telling me like that's going to be the next battlefield that I'm going to put you in because there's going to be a lot of people coming out of that or realizing suddenly as a 40, 50 year old person that they went through that and they're going to go, who do I turn to for help? Like no one knows anything about it, you know? So. Yeah. You will love our episode coming out with Yako Boyens in a couple of weeks and that episode on SRA is something that none of us have ever done before as well as him. And that conversation was so powerful. And that was the first true podcast that we've all done together on SRA, including him. He, he's never spoke that in depth about it. And so to hear him and him being on the front lines in rescuing children, you will appreciate that one. I know we did. And we all left at that podcast in tears, goosebumps and wow. the amount of prayer and God's work and the power on that call forever changed all of us. 
So I'm excited to wow. share that one with everyone listening. And for people and listening, gonna... coming out after Kern's episode that you're listening to right now. So you guys have a sneak peek of what next week is. <laughs> That's amazing. Yako is literally the one that inspired me to do this in the first place many, many years ago. I listened to him for the first time. I, I specifically remember calling my dad up. I don't know why I called my dad, but I called my dad up afterwards and I'm like, the Lord just told me what I'm going to do with my life next. And it was just like, Yako is inspiring a whole army of people to rise up and do something and not just sit back and learn about it, but to really get involved and do something because that's what it's, that's what it requires. And I just, I have mad respect for him. I, anything he says, I'm like, I'm all ears. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. He has, he started his own podcast and we've actually, it's been an honor to work with him and we've gotten to meet him personally in Arizona and get to see him speak. And now I'm sure we'll be working with him more in the future, but he inspired us. And I know he's someone that we all look up to as well. And Corinne, we think that same way about you, you know, thank you mm -hmm. for being boots on the ground. Thank you for putting action behind something that touched your heart and not sitting back or, or not looking at it and not caring. You know, I knew it was so important to bring you on because you are somebody who learned something hard and said, I need to get involved. What do I do? And we get asked that so much. What are some things that I can do? You know, and we hope our example helps people to create content, but there's also a need. There's people that actually want to get out in their communities and might be frustrated thinking there's nothing I can do. And you're the perfect example that that's absolutely not true. And that even just doing something small for your own community, for your state makes a tremendous impact worldwide. And you don't know what that's going to do for future generations and how that's going to heal people that may have put trauma and perpetuate it to the next generation. You're helping them break free of that. So they never have to be put in a position to even do that consciously or unconsciously. So we can't thank you enough for all your hard work, Corinne. And it's been an honor working with you and we can't wait to see you grow and to see what the Lord has in store for you. Cause we know it's going to be tremendous and we just Aww, appreciate your friendship you. everything that you're doing and that you took the time today to come educate people and, and you know share some of those experiences that people are curious about yeah and just to wrap up to go off of that I do get asked a lot like I want to get involved what can I do and you know from multiple different states and I always say if you can I would avoid the big organizations that are like way, you know, way in front of the world and raising tons of money. Um, I would look for the little guy and that's, they're the ones I'm finding are really doing the boots on the ground hard work. They're maybe not going to have as much money coming in and they're not going to have all the bells and whistles, but because of that, they're not corrupted at all. And they don't have these powerful men that are pulling the strings behind everything. And so I, what I always suggest is just look, start looking into online, let's say within a 30 mile radius of me, what anti-trafficking organization or ministry, even in, in a little church, um, what are they? And then call them up, talk to them, interview them. Like, is this going to be a good fit for me? First of all, I would say, pray about it. Ask God to lead you to the right place because he has a spot for you to serve. That's going to fit everything that he's given you to do and life experience and all these things. And he's got a sweet spot for you. So ask God, you know, lead me where, where can I be best used? in doing something about this and then, you know, interview these organizations that are around you and find out, ask to see their, um, ask to see their books. Where's their money going? Is it going to survivors or is it going to the politician to smoothie up next to you? If it's going to a big name guy or whatever, then run, like do not be around. <laughs> like I've seen our books and our books, that money is all going straight to the girl and so you know that's what you want to see in an organization or a ministry that's truly doing god's work so 
great advice. And like I said, it's such an honor to have you on. You're such a wealth of knowledge. And for people listening, please connect with Corinne, go follow her, email her. If you have questions, join our Telegram chat. You're going to get to, you can actually reach out to her there um, or message her privately on Telegram too, although there's a lot of spam on there. So you might be safer going into our chat and getting a hold of her that way. And you can come support us in the meantime. So please do share this everywhere. Um, we need more awareness of how this actually works. And Corinne, thank you so much for coming on. It's such an honor. Thank you, girls. I just love you. I wish we could just all be together. I know. <laughs> like in one room. <laughs> we'll send you virtual hugs. I know, virtual <laughs> hugs. And this won't be the last time you guys hear from Corinne. I'm sure we'll have her on again because she is, like I said, she's like an honorary member of our team. So we'll bring her back on Thank soon. Thank you. Right. Corinne, I know you have to get running, so I will let you go. Yeah. And we will all see right. you. Bye, girl. I'm sure we'll talk to you in just a minute. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So I'm going to. Ooh, okay. So for people listening, um, I want to stress, I haven't really talked about this a lot on a podcast, and I figured I'd finish this since I have these two girls on. We just started an incredible merch line. Becky has done an incredible job helping get that all set up with the uh, gentleman who's helping us get that. And I figured, Becky, I don't know if you have it up on your screen, but I figured one of us could show while we're here and yeah. just a little, let me bring this up before we go. Um, that way we can show people, uh, we thought it was really important to get our message out there too. We wanna see people wearing clothing that brings awareness to this. This is just a starting point for us, what we did. This actually took us months to get out. We just wanted to get something out that represented us as a small little collection and we're gonna keep adding to it. Um, but this was really special to us because we care about branding and, and getting these messages out. And we see messages for everything. We see, you can't go anywhere without seeing let's go Brandon or something about politics or, but you don't see a lot of stuff about human trafficking and about child abuse. So we wanted to start some type of an apparel line that helps bring awareness to that, that people can wear and feel comfortable. And it starts a conversation. Maybe it's for people who don't directly wanna go say something, but wanna make a statement without using their voice. You know, it's a great stepping stone to just get used to, to helping people understand that this exists. So um, Becky, you're more than welcome to, screen, to share the screen whenever. All right. I figured we would just do a little video demonstration and show you guys what we've been working so hard on. And um, can you see our website? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to bring you guys to our website first because yes. we talk about, we talk about this all the time. We have um, multiple things here. If you are new to this, this trafficking, you want more information. We actually have more information right here on our website. You've never heard of this. You want to show somebody you want to get more um, topics to research, different things like that, you can absolutely come here. We've created um, an ebook, kind of how is it all connected, um, just trafficking that, you know what, we, we talk about all these things. We talk about trafficking and pedophilia and SRA and how the entertainment industry gets involved. All of the symbolism that you find, this is a place to kind of start there and grab that information. We do have all of our podcasts listed. So if you're like, where can I go? We have everything on YouTube, but still, if you want one stop shop, because sometimes it's hard to find on YouTube, our channels, because they don't want us to get this stuff out. Um, you can come here. Everything's uploaded. It's, I try to stay on top of it, but most recent stuff should be there. Um, if you hear about somebody on one of our um, podcasts that you want to see, we have a, a place to connect with people. We also have digital resources, especially for the parents out there that you can come and kind of take a look and see. Um, we also have a survivor store. If you want to know where, how can you help, where to go, and you're not one who wants to create content, you're not one who wants to go bash down doors and, and save the kids or you can't, here's a great place to start. Start, start. Um, helping our survivors buy their books and give um, a bunch of book people. That's also a great way if you don't want to, or you don't know yet how to talk about stuff, get mm -hmm. a book that is centered around some, or some type of content or promote a service from a survivor. And yep. you're not only helping their business, but you you can educate people in the process. Yep. So we have all of our survivors. If they have a book or a service or music, anybody who's been on our podcast, we also 
support them. So we have, um, again, our survivor uh, store. So please come here and buy their music, buy their documentaries, do all of that stuff. And then finally, that was a long-winded way of getting to our stuff. We oh, also sorry. have... Uh, we also have our merchandise and we will be adding new things, changing new things. More than likely, some of this stuff's going to be pulled down. So if you like something, um, buy it now, because with the exception of our logo, this stuff's going to start kind of turning over. Um, we chose something as simple as this Luke 17, two chapter or chapter verse, um, because it would be, it says it would be better be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. And so it's very easy. It's one of those shirts that you don't have to know what it's about. I mean, the wearer does, but the other people don't necessarily know and they'll look at it and they'll go look something up and they'll be like, oh, okay, what's Stand by Survivors and kind of look at that. So we have many options in that sizes for kids. We're adding different options as well that hasn't get, been put out there. Um, again, we have our logo. This is probably my favorite thing that we have. Um, is anything with our logo on it because it really is kind of who we are that the Christian values behind it. It's the X for the by standby survivors. We have t-shirts, we've got hoodies. Um, at the end of our podcast, um, Bridget always says survivors, we hear you, we see you, we stand, stand by you. And so we thought it'd be really cool to put on the back of a hoodie. Um, so we have that, we have hats, we have backpacks, we have crop top sweatshirts, one of the, our taglines, if you saw when I first got the page, is everyone has a story. We firmly believe that. That is why it's our tagline. So we made a shirt for that. And then, um, like I said, that's if you click on the buy here, it will take you to um, Stoked Apparel, who is uh, the guy that's helping us. Um, but you can come to our website and get everything here and, and keep track of it because we will be changing and updating and moving things around. And Becky's just done such a phenomenal job. Like she said, there's a lot of resources on our website and it's something that we're all not used to promoting enough. So I wanted to make sure that we highlighted this because we, you know, we want our podcast to be a one-stop shop for resources, for learning directly from the survivors. And we thought we'd complement that by creating a website that encapsulates all of what we're learning in one spot and any ways that you can connect with us, connect with them, support them. Um, you guys can just go on our website. And even if you have, say you work somewhere, if you're at a safe house and you can just go download Becky's or uh, print out Becky's handouts that she's created on what trafficking is and, or give it to a family member. It's all very PC in a sense. Um, there's nothing too graphic in it. So it's, it's something that anybody can pick up and read for the most part and get just a general 101 on what some of this stuff is. So we really want you guys to use this as a resource and to of course support us. You know, it's so exciting to think that one day we could be walking on the street and see somebody wearing our logo proudly on, on a hoodie or on a hat, you know, that that's a dream of ours to have this message stand by survivors, get out there and be something that we all take our, our foot, put it down and stand by. So Becky, thank you so much for doing that and for you know, creating and, and keeping that website updated. You've done such an amazing job. Yeah, you have. Thank you. Appreciate it. You guys handle the podcast. I handle the website. We got it all figured out. <laughs> you're, on, you're on a podcast too. Are you kidding? And you jump on mine sometimes. So I know, we, but I don't have to connect and get schedules figured out. That's Bridget's job. So. <laughs> it takes all the hard to do what we're doing. It does. <laughs> and for people listening, remind them where they can find you girls also on social media. Yeah, I am Becky underscore standby survivors on um, Instagram. Um, I don't, that's probably where you'd find me the most. I'm also the co-host of Save Our Children podcast um, with Bridget. That's more of a parenting podcast. Uh, we don't tell you how to parent. We just kind of give you all the resources and you pick and choose what you need. So you can find our podcast at Save Our Children podcast. If you click the link in any of our bios, you will find all of our personal pages, all of our content, everything that we do works hand in hand together. So if you are trying to get to Emma's stuff and her podcast, click the links in our bio. If you're trying to get to our stuff, her bio leads you to us. So, and then everything leads you, leads you back to our telegram and our website. So everything that we do is hand in hand and we do it all together. And even though you might see us pop up everywhere, it's really all 
one and we're working together. So yeah, just click the links in our bios and you'll find us all. This is so fun. I appreciate you girls joining me. It's always fun to have us together because we talk all the time together, but we have our two separate shows. So it's always fun whenever we can come on together. And so we gave you a sneak peek of next week. You guys will, if you haven't met him yet, um, I would say to go to Bridget and Becky's podcast. They've done an episode with Yako Boyans. That was phenomenal. So you guys will get to know him and know his backstory. We talk about some different things on the episode coming up next week. So um, if you guys are curious, go to their podcast. Again, it's in my, uh, not Linktree, but Direct Me. Linktree kicked me off for talking about this stuff, which is crazy. So I'm on direct direct.me, um, but my link's down there. You guys can go listen to his first episode with them, which was phenomenal. And you guys are going to be in for a real treat next week. We're going to all be together again with him. And you guys will get to learn some really interesting things from him that he doesn't talk about a lot. Um, help promote this 